Well, guys, welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I am really excited about this teaching tonight. I know, I don't know if all of you were here when I mentioned that I like am not at all prepared for this teaching, which is one of the like most exciting um, times to teach because you have to totally depend on the Holy Spirit to speak through you. And so that's what I'm doing tonight. Um, I feel like God has like been in his faithfulness, just connecting dots throughout the day and throughout the couple weeks that, you know, I've been reading and studying. Um, but usually I spend today just like focused. I go in my room, I shut the door and I just spend the whole day, like organizing my thoughts and my notes and cross-referencing and looking at Hebrew words and just spend that. I mean, literally like from the time I wake up until you guys walk in the door, turn on the screen, I'm doing that. And today I just couldn't do that. I had, and then last night, of course, Miles needed my help with homework. So we were up till 11. So I didn't have any time last mm. night. And then, and, but it's exciting because those 30 minute windows that I did have, God would just give me like this little mm. revelation. And so I have all of the things that I feel like the Lord wants to share tonight, but how that comes out, I don't know. And so um, if it feels a little disjointed at times, that's why, but I'm trusting that God's going to help me articulate this message in such a way that it penetrates. Oh, I'm emotional, so you know the spirit is here. Um, so let's pray and let's get started. Father, um, thank you um, for your faithfulness. God, thank you that you are good and kind and compassionate and you have a message, God, that you desire to bring tonight. And so Father, we just welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this place. We invite you to come and to inhabit this conversation and this study, um, that you would be glorified and lifted high and that our ears, God, would be open God, to what your spirit is saying tonight and the urgency, God, of this word and the importance of us to understand and to see in this time. God, I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation to fall upon us tonight and all those who hear this message, God, I just trust you that you are going to use this word as an arrow, God, a sharp arrow that goes and finds its point and its purpose and that it will penetrate hearts and it will dig deep inside the hearts of your people and it will grow and bear fruit for your kingdom. And so God, I yield to you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you here and just thank you, God, that you desire to meet with us tonight. And um, we just recognize that you're here. And we um, just set this side, aside this time as holy and recognize the sacredness of your presence. Um, we just lift you up and exalt you. You're worthy, God. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Oh, hi. <laughs> you may have may appear. <laughs> Two are my friends, okay. Diana and Matthew. Welcome. Thank mm -hmm. you guys so much Cynthia, for coming. Karen and Debbie. Yes. And then we have a few ladies on the screen as well. And so we're doing kind of a hybrid night. And um, yeah, so I get a little bit of emotional when I, when I um, read God's word and study. So um, thanks for being here. If you guys want any water or a cookie, they're out there behind you. So, okay. So tonight is going to be really fun because we are going to talk about the Feast of Purim um, as well as Joshua chapter 6. And of course, God and his sovereignty and his faithfulness and his timing has woven together these two um, studies in such a beautiful way that, of course, I could not have done on my own. It was the Holy Spirit and God just revealed these connections to me. And... Um, also the Torah portion. And so you guys know that um, every week the Jewish people read a sort, certain portion of the Torah. And it just so happens that the week, this week, the portion that all the Jewish people are reading all over the world, if they're reading the Torah, um, are reading again, something that I believe connects to the study tonight. So God is just so good to connect the Torah portion to Joshua chapter six to the Feast of Purim. Um, only God can do that in his sovereign hand. And so I'm excited to, to try to make all those connections. Um, and so, again, I was saying before you guys got here, like, I, I did not have a lot of time to prepare for this study, which is exciting because that means the Holy Spirit is going to teach for me. Um, but I want to start with the Feast of Purim. And so if you guys are, I'm, I'm going to kind of just assume that you don't know a whole lot about Purim so that we can all get on the same page and kind of understand the perspective that I believe God wants to give tonight. So Purim is a holiday that the Jewish people celebrate 
um, and it is found in the book of Esther. Um, so you guys, you know, if you want to open up your Bibles to the book of Esther, you can do that. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of recap um, what the, the story of Purim is, and then we will um, go from there. So I'm going to start with this quote. Um, and this is a quote, since I'm, I pulled up some of my notes from, I don't know, probably like six years ago on Purim. So I'm like, ah, I'm gonna, I gotta pull this up. So there's a quote, I don't know where it comes from, but these aren't my words, but someone awesome and amazing said this about Purim. The message of Purim is that God will not stand by idly and watch the destruction of his people. He will continue to fight for them from generation to generation whether it is through an overt display of his power, as in the Exodus from Egypt, or a more hidden form of help, as in the book of Esther, he will defend the Jewish people. In the Passover Haggadah, um, which is just the, the story that we read at Passover, we read each and every, this is quotes from the Haggadah, in each and every generation, they rise up against to put an end to us. So this is talking about in every single generation since the beginning of God's people being formed, there has been a people that will rise up against mm. God's people, right? Mm. And so they say in every generation, they rise up against us to put an end to us. But the Holy One, blessed is he, rescues us from their hand. So as we celebrate Purim, we also eagerly await the day when Messiah will return, establish the kingdom, defeat Israel's enemies, and wipe out their memory once and for all. And so as we study tonight, we're going to see that the Feast of Purim, which celebrates the deliverance of God's people, is really a shadow and a type of the greater rescue that will happen in the last days when Messiah Yeshua comes and rescues us from the Antichrist and the world system and all of the things that are going to come about in the next few years and, and after. And so, um, and also this brings us back to what we're reading in Joshua chapter six, guys, because as we're, so Joshua chapter six is the story of the, the battle of Jericho. So if you guys remember, this is like the, um, when the conquest begins. So we've We've gone through Joshua 1 through 5, and it was really preparation mm -hmm. of the people to prepare for the battle. And Joshua 6 moves into the section of the book of Joshua that goes through all of the battles that are going on. And so what Joshua foreshadows is the same thing that what's foreshadowed here in Purim, that there's coming a time when our Messiah will come and deliver his people. Okay, and he will establish his kingdom, his rule, his reign. And so we're going to start with Purim, and then we'll go to the book of Joshua. And then we will bring all of that together and look at some passages in Isaiah and Revelation and see how they connect to, again, what's happening now in our day and in the years to come as it relates to God's deliverance of his people. So the, the word Purim, um, means casting lots. And so in the story of Esther, Haman is the bad guy. And it's traditional um, when you tell the story of Esther that, you know, they would say boo when you hear the name Haman. And when we say Esther and Mordecai, everyone, everyone you know, shouts with joy. Um, and we don't have to do that tonight, but just so that we know who all the people are in the story, um, Haman, Haman is the one who called for the destruction of God's people. And the, the way that he determined when that was going to be was casting lots. And the Hebrew word Purim is where it means to um, cast lots. And so the, the timing of this is, you know, so we're, we're studying the book of Joshua. So we're kind of on the timeline of God's delivered his people out of Egypt. We've gone through 40 years in the wilderness. And now Joshua has been commissioned to bring Israel into the promised land. And we know that after that happens in the conquest of the land, there's hundreds of years of, you know, God's people turning away from him and then coming back. And then we have the kings that eventually come. We have the period of the judges and then we have the kings. And then we see the kingdom divided. And ultimately the Northern kingdom is taken captive by the Assyrians and then the southern kingdom Judah is taken captive by Babylon and then the people of Israel are sent into exile for 70 years okay and after that time of exile when they begin to come back into the land some of the people stayed in Babylon stayed in the region of Persia modern day Iran and and the, this is where the time of the story of Esther takes place mm -hmm. so there are there are some people that have gone back to the land of Israel but in a primarily from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. 
and some Levites, but, but there are some people still living in the diaspora, okay, or in exile, as you would say. And so, and it's interesting when you look at like a timeline of world history, I, I believe it's the same time that Socrates was like doing his thing in Greece. So it's just cool to put like the Bible in like real history, real time. This is when Esther was living. This is when King Xerxes was living. Um, and this is what, what's happening. And so, um, Obviously, um, in the story, Esther, she's one of the, the main characters, right? She is a Jewish orphan um, who is chosen by the king of Persia at that time to become his new wife, right? Because his wife Vashti would not dance before him in probably some very unholy way. And so he had her kind of excommunicated and did this whole pageant. And we know that Mordecai, who is Esther's uncle, encourages her to enter into the beauty contest or enter into this pageant and she ends up being chosen right as the next queen of Persia and so um and then Haman obviously he's the villain so we have the bad guy Haman we have the king who really is kind of a neutral figure and then we have Esther and her uncle Mordecai who are both Jewish but the Jewishness of Esther remains hidden and that's one um, thing I want to point out before we move on in the story is the, the hiddenness of the book of Esther and the significance of that hiddenness. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that just for a minute. Um, it's an overriding theme as we see these evil plots kind of being conceived and then the redemptive, redemption of God, um, all of this is kind of happening under the surface. And like a lot of the different players in the story are unaware of the different aspects of what's happening. Um, and there's, there are several things that we could talk to. I'll give just a few examples. So Esther's Jewishness is hidden. You know, the king does not know that she's Jewish. Um, and her name actually, um, Esther, comes from the Hebrew word, it shares a root with the Hebrew word that means hidden. And so even her name reveals that aspect of the story. The name of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. And I think we all know that we've heard that, but that's one of the primary things that, that you know, there's a hiddenness of God. And yet at the same time, we're seeing all of this being revealed as God's hand. Like it's obvious that God is at work because too many things in the story happen that, you know, coincidentally, which they're not coincidence, coincidence. God is very much a part of the story of Esther and what's going on. It's just his name is not mentioned because the, the book of Esther wants us to understand that there's a hidden nature to this. Um, so another example of the hiddenness would be that um, the plans that Haman has to destroy the Jewish people have been hidden from the king. He doesn't realize that Haman, Haman has made this edict to go and destroy, ultimately kill all of the Jewish people. He doesn't realize that his, his bride, his um, queen is um, Jewish. He doesn't realize that Mordecai, who has served the king and done well for the king, is Jewish. Okay, and so there's probably like 10 or 11 things that if we went through every single one of them, we would see, okay, this is showing us that there's something, there's a hidden nature to this book. But this hiddenness is going to actually be um, revealing the work and the redemption of God. And we'll, we'll talk more about that um, in just a little bit. So one of the things about the story um, as it relates to the edict that Haman makes, because Haman is like one of the king's right hand men. Okay, and Haman makes this edict that on the certain day that he drew lots, and that's where we get the name Purim, he's determined that all the Jewish people are going to go be destroyed. Okay, and um, when the king learns of this um, news that this is what has happened um, from Esther, he makes a, he cannot rescind because he gave his stamp of approval for Haman's plan, not knowing ultimately what Haman wanted to do. Okay, um, but the key, what, what's important is that we know that the king cannot rescind his command. Okay, he's made this command, he's declared this, and it can't be rescinded. But what he does instead, when he learns of the nature of it, and that his wife Esther is a Jew, and that Mordecai is Jewish, and that this will kill all of her people, he actually sends a new decree that doesn't you know, take away the old decree, but it allows the Jewish people to rise up and defend themselves, okay? And so this new decree kind of is a, a renewal and overrides, if you will, this old decree. 
Um, and so that's an important aspect of the story. Um, and I, you know, I was, I'm thinking about the significance of that and, and, and I'm going to go through and kind of um, God, I think God wants us to see like how all of these are shadows and types and, and what is, you know, this story pointing towards because every story in the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of um, the work of Messiah. Okay, so we're always going to look for Messiah. Where is Jesus? Where is Yeshua in this story? And he, I believe he's in several places. Okay, and, and I love how, how God does these things that are somewhat, um, I'll, I'll get there. So um, this decree that, that the king has, has made, this new decree. Now, if you remember the way that this new decree comes, do you guys remember how Esther told the king? Like what, what were some of the, the situations surrounding her approaching the king and um, asking the king for, do you guys, have you read this story? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, she actually, so Karen just, just talked about praying and fasting. And so it was a big deal. Like it was going to, couldn't have meant her death had she just approached the king without him holding out his scepter and allowing her to come see him. Because you, you have to be asked. Okay, so she basically, she risked her life in order to save her people. Okay, she was willing to lay her life down. Okay, and what she asked the people to do you know, and Mordecai was the one who told her all about this because she didn't know either. It was hidden from her, um, you know, until Mordecai revealed that to her that Haman was doing this. But she asked all of the Jewish people to pray, to fast, um, and, and intercede for. Are you recording? Yes, I'm recording. Yes, okay. So she asked everyone to pray, to intercede, because she was going to go approach the king. And so she and the people for three days. They prayed, they fasted, and they, um, you know, of course, God's name isn't mentioned, but here they are crying out to the God of Israel, okay? And so what happens is, is that the king, she approaches the king, um, and he gives her his favor. He arises and shows her favor, and he invites her in, and she doesn't reveal to him right away. She keeps it hidden for a little bit and instead does a series of banquets um, to reveal. And there's, there's probably like every detail, something that relates. And I don't know all the details because I, again, didn't have time to go through it. Um, but, but at the, ultimately she tells the king, Hey, here's the plan of Haman. And the king says, okay, I can't resend this, but I can give a new decree. Okay. And, and that's how it happened. And so it's important for us to realize that there was a time of prayer and fasting. And there was a time where she basically risked her, her own life for the sake of her people. Okay, and all of those things are going to be shadows and types. Um, but this, I wanted to talk about this decree for just a second, because as I'm thinking about that, you know, it, it is so parallel. If we were to kind of compare King Xerxes as a, a picture of God in the story, okay? God is king, okay? And he's the one who, who determines um, what happens in the earth, okay? And, and so when we look at God and the decrees that he has made, like God has a, you know, his rule, his authority, his Torah, his teachings, it is filled with both blessing and, curse, and curses, right? When we look at, um, and even the whole scope of God's work from Genesis to Revelation, we know that the message is, is that we are sinners, right? And we deserve death. And so in a sense, there has been a decree that has been issued over all mankind that death is coming. Death is, you know, the wages of sin is death. All we like sheep have gone astray. We each deserve to die. And, and in a sense, God's word has declared that decree has gone forth and there is consequence for our sin. And there is penalty for our sin. And God doesn't erase that right? God doesn't erase that. He doesn't rescind that, that decree. It stands, but he's also sent a new decree, right? He has renewed his covenant with us through the shed blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, who lays his life down for us, right? And so now you can see Esther as a shadow and a type of Yeshua. Why? Because she risked her own life. She doesn't actually have to die. Yeshua dies on our behalf, but she lays her life down and makes intercession as Yeshua intercedes for us to bring deliverance to the people, 
And the new decree that, that you know, Xerxes sends forth is similar to the new decree that God has sent through Yeshua, that yes, the wages of sin is death, but I have provided deliverance for you. You know, I have provided Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah as the sacrifice for your sin. And so I, God's defending us, right? We don't have to die under the curse, but we get to be redeemed by the blood of the lamb and we get to live. Okay. And so that is one of the, the primary messages in the book of Esther, as it relates to a shadowing type of the Messiah. Ultimately, Purim is a day of deliverance, okay? The Feast of Purim, which was at first going to be a day of destruction, has now been reversed and become a day of celebration, okay? And the, the Feast of Purim is to be celebrated. If you guys look in the book of Esther, um, the, the decree that goes forth, or I guess the... Um, it's always hard to find in this Bible that has them all different. I think it's after Psalms. Thank you. I'm glad you have the same Bible. Did you say 1228? Yes. No, we have different. We have different. Right after Ecclesiastes? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Esther. So let's read a few of the key passages here. So Mordecai, Esther's uncle, recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews in all the provinces of King Xerxes, both near and far, instructing them to observe the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day every year to commemorate the days on which the Jews obtained rest from their enemies and the month which for them was turned from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. They were to make them days of celebrating and rejoicing, sending portions of food to each other and giving gifts to the poor. And so the, you know, Mordecai sent this to all of the Jews in the land that this is now going to be a day of rejoicing. It was a day of weeping and sorrow that God has turned into rejoicing and deliverance, a day of celebration. And why? Because God has given them rest from their enemies. And that's going to be important, especially when we think about the book of Joshua and what's going on there. And so um, still today, the Jewish people celebrate Purim, commemorating their deliverance. And it's important for us to realize that if Haman was successful, in annihilating the Jewish people, we would not be sitting in this room today talking about the God of Israel because Messiah would not have been, you know, coming, right? So we, we know that it is important for the preservation of God's people is just as much as the enemy comes after every generation, God promises to protect and preserve every generation because God's people are evidence of God's existence and of God's plan and purposes. And so God is going to protect his people every generation, even up until the time of his coming. And so you just read the passage. I, oh, I'm sorry, did I not tell you guys? This is Esther chapter nine, mm -hmm. and this is verse 20 through 22. Okay. Sorry. Um, yes. I see. Okay, you see it? Okay. So Purim is a day of deliverance. And what's really interesting about the name Purim, guys, it actually shares a root word with the Hebrew word Kippur. You guys know what Kippur is? Kippur? Yom Kippur? Yes, Kippur. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. So Kippur is the Hebrew word that means to cover, okay? And, is, and, and so Yom Kippur is also about deliverance, right? It's the day that God atones for the sin of his people, right? And so he delivers them from our own sin and our own flesh, okay? And so what's interesting about this is that Yom Kippur, it's actually, um, they say Yom Kippurim. So they make Kippur plural, like there's a doubleness in it, okay? There's, and, and actually they say it's a day like Purim. Yom Kippur is a day like Purim. It's a day of God's deliverance. It's a, a day of God rescue. It's a day where, and what are you doing on Yom Kippur? You're fasting, you're weeping, 
you're mourning, but then God brings his deliverance and he turns this time of fasting and mourning into a time of rejoicing. What happens after Yom Kippur? The next holiday that we celebrate after Yom Kippur? Well, that's Rosh Hashanah. That's before. So what's after Yom Kippur? Tabernacles. And what is tabernacles? What is Sukkot about? It's a time of rejoicing. God dwelling with man, it's a time of rejoicing. Remember, this is the only holiday where God says, you're going to have joy, right? He says, you're going to rejoice at tab tabernacles. You're going to celebrate God dwelling with man. Okay, so we can see the parallel here. We see it that God takes Yom Kippur, a day of fasting and mourning, and he brings deliverance and brings us to tabernacles. He brings us to a day of rejoicing, a day of joy. And so Purim is a picture of that. It's a picture of God bringing deliverance mm -hmm. to his people, turning mourning and sorrow into gladness and joy. And this is the commandment in Purim, for Purim, is to celebrate with joy, okay? And, and what I think is really cool is that, you know, God's name isn't mentioned, but when we see the comparison to tabernacles, where is God? Right there in their midst, right? He's dwelling with them. He's in their midst, okay? And so that's what it it hints at, that's what Purim is hinting at, Yom Kippur and Tabernacles. Um, Can so, I throw in a third yes, day connection? Every please. time I see third day, you know, on the third of day, course. right? Yeah. So um, Esther 5, now it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes. So you think about oh, on, on the third that's day. That's beautiful. And mm -hmm. stood in the inner court of the king's palace. Amen, okay, so, so <laughs> what is that, Debbie? In front of the king's rooms. Okay, so another, I mean, a beautiful picture and shadow of Messiah, right? After three days of fasting, which, you know, that's Yeshua actually is in the grave, but on the third day, he's in the presence of the king. And that, and that number three is all throughout the Torah. Yes. It's like three days the spies yeah. hid and then they went. Yes. Or three days Ziklag and he got all this stuff mm -hmm. back. Or three days they went and the water was bitter and it became sweet. Yeah. So, so that, that, yeah. that something That's really deep. bad was going to happen, mm -hmm. but then God awesome. turned it around for good. That's so beautiful. Yeah. And we've tapped into that. A day is like a thousand, a thousand is like a day. Mm -hmm. On the third, On the third day. day Yes. So guys, we're having this awesome revelation over here about the importance of the number three all throughout scripture. What was your name again? Matthew. Matthew mm -hmm. has been reminding us that they're just peppered throughout all of the Torah, all of the Tanakh are these references to three days and how, you know, something bad was coming or happening, but on the third day, God reverses it or God brings his presence. I think of um, Exodus chapter 19, prepare yourself for the third day. It was on that day that the presence of God came and met them on Mount Sinai, you know, so and, and he <clears throat> mentioned in Joshua, the, the spies being hidden for three days. And then, you know, ultimately we'll talk about this as they, they come in and they are going to bring out about the conquest of Canaan, but all of these three days, like Debbie mentioned, are of course hinting and causing us to understand a work of the Messiah, right? That's what it's all pointing towards. And that Yeshua, our Messiah, would be three days buried and then he would resurrect and he would put on his royal robe and he would stand before the king, right? And he continues to make intercession. He doesn't stop making intercession after three days. He continues at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. Mm -hmm. um, so what a beautiful thing. Thank you for pointing that out. Anybody else have any, any things from that that popped out? That's so good. So this verse we have to talk about when we, we study the book of Esther. One of the most famous verses in Esther is found in Esther 4.14. Um, and, um, and, and really the point of this is that it kind of driving home the truth that God will always defend his people. Okay, he will never leave them. He has entered into an eternal covenant. And so Esther 4.14, um, it says, talking, you know, Mordecai talking to Esther, he says, if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Mm. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so just again, the sovereignty of God and positioning Esther in that place, you know, to intercede on behalf of her people. And Mordecai was exactly right. He's like, God has given you this opportunity. He has placed you here for this purpose. And if you keep silent, like there's a time to keep silent. And we'll look at that in Joshua. 
There's a time to keep silent and there's a time to speak. And this was the time for Esther to speak. And she was positioned here for such a time as this. He says, God will bring deliverance if you choose not to speak. It's, and so in some ways, you know, when we think about comparing that to maybe our lives and how, you know, God might call us to do some very hard things that we might have to be willing to lay down our own lives to make intercession for God's people. You know, the, the, the comfort is, is that if we keep silent, deliverance will still come. So it's not 100% dependent on us, but God is looking. He searches the whole earth looking for someone who will be faithful to him and who will say like all of these amazing people that we read about in the scriptures, here I am, God. I will go, send me, use me. He's looking for those faithful people who will say, yes, God, I will stand in the gap. I will make intercession. And I believe that it's important for us to understand how does this relate to us? You know, is God going to ask us to do something like he's asked Esther, something like he asked Rahab in Joshua chapter two? And I would say, yes, he will. And, and both of these are for the preservation of God's people, right? In the story of Joshua chapter two, Rahab is hiding, and, and that's going to come up in Joshua chapter six today, but Rahab is hiding God's people, okay, from destruction. And then here in Esther, she is making intercession for God's people. She's, she's pleading at the throne room, okay? It's like if we were to imagine if God, if we were to even, we can actually take the stance in the position of Esther today as, as the Gentile bride of Christ. We can go into the presence of the king and we can pray and we can fast and we can intercede and cry out for the deliverance of God's people. And I believe not only can we, but I think we must. Mm -hmm. I believe it is a, a calling on the Gentile church to, in, in this day, in this season. That's, that's something that's been hidden, guys. That has been hidden for 2000 years. The significance of the role of the Gentile church in the deliverance of God's people. That has been something that has been hidden, but it's now being revealed because now is the time, now is the season for the church to understand her role in bringing about the deliverance of God's people. And so I would say primarily, you know, one of the biggest takeaways I would hope that you take from this is to, to go into the presence of God into the throne room and cry out for the deliverance of his people. Because if you realize that today, there are still in this generation, right? Hamans of the day that want to completely annihilate the physical descendants of Abraham who live in the land of Israel, right? This is the same story has not changed from the time of the Amalekites, right? It's the same people group, guys, the same people group that are today in modern day per Persia, Iran. They're the same Amalekites from the story of the Exodus, okay? They're the same Amalekites. Haman, do you guys realize Haman? was an Amalekite. Okay. He, and so if you guys remember when this began and what did God say about the Amalekites? Does anyone remember from book of Exodus? I don't know that they, they had to be wiped out. At the wiped out. Oh, that's right. Right. They didn't Obliterated. Yeah. Okay. But they did it. Right. And then, and then what did God tell Saul? Saul. Yeah. Exactly. And guess what? Amalekites there. And King Saul, Saul didn't do it. Right. He didn't completely destroy them. And so what do we have happening now in the time of Esther? They're still, because why? Because they will be in a forever pursuit to wipe out the kingdom of God. And we'll talk about the significance of this, really this holy cosmic battle that's happening behind the scenes and in the unseen realm. Guys, this is a bigger battle. It's not about the physical Haman and the physical Esther. There's a, I mean, it is, but there's a spiritual battle that's <coughs> raging around us that is, is happening is very real, right? And so, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the point here is, is that God will deliver his people, right? And, and this, unfortunately, um, you know, because of the inability or the, you know, disobedience to not wipe out the Amalekites, they're still dealing with it. And guys, we're still dealing with it today. If you guys look at some of the language that comes out from Iran, I mean, they literally say some of the same exact things that you read in Psalm 83, like destroy Israel, wipe her off the map. Like that's really one of the messages. And, and so it's important for us to understand that that same spirit is at work. 
Okay, that same spirit's at work. And we actually get to play a part as Esther did in interceding for God's people. So I'm going to, I'm not sure if I want to go into that until the end. So I'm going to kind of now transition from Esther after I say this one last thing about it. So one of the, one, another interesting thing about the um, shadow and the type that Esther is of Messiah, when you think about her hidden Jewishness, and you think about that in the context of um, Yeshua, Jesus, what, what do you think about? How could that possibly also be a clue as, I'll just tell you. <laughs> so think about this. She, her Jewishness was not made aware. Right. And so for 2000 years, the church has been living under that veil of not realizing the Jewishness of Jesus. Right. A lot of the church, it's been hidden. It's from been Jews too, really, because they don't exactly. think of Jesus as Jewish. Exactly. Exactly. And then they, when they do, they normally kind of like, you know, uh, eye opening. Yeah. Candy. For sure. I mean, that's exactly right. It's been hidden from everybody, right? Um, and, and really, it's a, it's shadows. And we've talked about this before in our study, but it's very similar to the story of Joseph, right? Joseph is a type and shadow of Messiah, and he is sent off to save the nations, just as Jesus was sent to save the nations. But ultimately, God sent him into Egypt to save Israel, right? Because Israel and his family came and he was able to provide for his own brothers. But until all the Gentile Egyptianness of Joseph was taken off, his brothers didn't recognize him because he looked just like an Egyptian. They did not recognize him. And that's what's been happening for 2000 years is that Yeshua has been a Gentile Jesus and has not looked like a Jewish Messiah. Okay, and so that I think that the book of Esther hints at that reality that the Jewishness being hidden, but it also shows us that there's a time when that needs to be revealed. Yes, there's an appointed time. There's an appointed time for the revealing of the Jewishness of Messiah. And we are living right in that season of these hidden things being revealed. It's like, it reminds me of the book of Daniel when it talks about seal up the scrolls, okay, until the time of the end. But right now we're seeing all this unsealing of the scrolls. We're seeing all of these things that have been hidden for centuries, in millennia, now being revealed. And, and I, I love the book of Esther because they when they read Esther, they read it from a scroll. Okay, it's the scroll of Esther. Okay, it's not, not from a, a book like this. And it, and it makes me think of, you know, breaking the seals off the scroll and unrolling the scroll. Like God's unrolling it and he's making it what was revealed, what was hidden, he's revealing it. Okay, and that and that's one of the primary things about Esther is that these hidden things will be revealed, okay? And so I think, yeah. I was just gonna say, I was thinking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how mm -hmm. 1948, Israel became a nation, mm -hmm. 1947, so this, they were sealed. Uh -huh. The seal was broken in the cave. Is that when they were found? Yes, 1947 by a Bedouin wow. and a friend, a Bedouin, wow. not a Jew, a Bedouin, mm -hmm. a Jewish person. So, I mean, it's just to me. The timing is so oh. perfect. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's time to unseal the scrolls yes. and it's yeah. time to reveal what has so been they, hidden. And they found the Isaiah, like the entire, the entire Isaiah, Isaiah scroll. scroll. And to authenticate, I mean, mm -hmm. authenticate. It's story. amazing. Guys, like, this is all so real. Okay, like we are living in an amazing time. Yeah. Like God has chosen us to be alive for such a time as mm -hmm. this, right? And if we don't stand up and speak when God says speak, mm -hmm. deliverance will come from someone else, okay? But the warning to Esther was like, you and your household will perish. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. And so, you know, and I think of even the words of Yeshua that says, you know, those who seek to save their lives will lose it. You know, like we are going to be asked to do hard things. We could be asked to hide Jewish people in our homes. We could, but we will be, and we are being asked to intercede for them where we are now. And um, that, guys, will be just as it was for Rahab. Think about her. 
she hid the Jewish people mm -hmm. in her home. And that was risking her very life. Mm -hmm. But what did it result in? Deliverance, Deliverance right? She was rescued. And her whole household. In her whole household, right. So God will be faithful and we can trust him. Okay, so now let's transition to Joshua 6 with all of that in mind and see how the Lord is going to connect these things. So Joshua chapter 6, um, this is when the conquest of Canaan begins. We ended Joshua 5 with this really cool like encounter that Joshua has with Yeshua, the captain of the Lord's army. Um, and so Joshua is told something that's very important. He says, Yeshua says to Joshua, take your sandals off your feet because the place where you are standing is holy. So I'm going to talk for just a second about the supernatural worldview of the Bible and this idea of holy ground and unholy ground, okay? It's things that have been consecrated, things that have been set apart. Holy means to be set apart, right? And so there are, the Bible is, when you read the Bible from the worldview of the Bible writers, okay, you are going to see a very supernatural story, okay? You're going to see a story of God fighting Satan, of angels and demons, of lesser gods called Elohim. Okay. The, the word for gods in Hebrew is Elohim. Okay. Our God that we serve is called Elohim, but he is distinctive because he's Yahweh. He's the Yutevate. He's Yahavah. He is God who is not like any other gods, but he's the creator of all of these beings. Okay. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that supernatural worldview and we're going to, which will take us back to, um, you know, Genesis 3, which is like the one of the first um, times we encounter one of these lesser Elohim, okay, which we refer to as Satan. Okay, that was not the name that was given here in Genesis chapter three, but we can understand from other biblical texts that this is a a fallen, we, we like to say a fallen angel, right? Someone who had a, a position among the lesser and, and the word really is and, and there's so much to go into and i can't go through all the scriptures and if this sounds like super wacky to you then here's the book called the unseen realm <laughs> but i'm going to try to do my best to bring um you know some of these truths to light so that you understand the bigger picture of what's happening as we look at the conquest of canaan because that's why it's important for us because we want to see what's really happening what's god really asking joshua to do Okay, and, and so I will, I do recommend this book, The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible by Michael Heiser. I will say just with any book, guys, not, we don't all have everything, right? You know, we don't all have everything right. And so just any book that you're reading, read it with, you know, caution. And so there are a few things in here that I'm like, I, that doesn't, I don't know. I, I, have, I have that book and I have that same. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. So some of the things, and especially at the end, I think there's hints of replacement theology, which is like, I'm really against that. That's such a false teaching. It's like he gets almost there. And so I would just say, again, read it with caution, but I do believe that there are many things I read in here that brought enlightenment and understanding and a continuity of scripture um, that I always thought was there, but never had the, you know, the time to, to search all of that out and he's done his homework. And so again, read it with caution, don't believe everything you read, but glean what you can um, from, from the pages. Um, but I will just say, you know, in Genesis chapter three, we see, you know, God putting this, this curse over the enemy and basically giving us a preview of what is going to be this great cosmic battle that's going to ensue from the seed of the woman, right? Let's see Genesis chapter three. It says in verse 14, he says to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust as long as you live. And I will put animosity between you and the woman and between her seed, your seed, and her seed. 
he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. And so this becomes kind of the key passage that alerts us to this great cosmic battle that will ensue between the seed of the woman, singular seed, which ultimately points to Yeshua, the Messiah, and the seed of the enemy. That means that there are going to be people throughout the history of, mm -hmm. of, of the world that will join forces with the serpent, okay? They will become, in a sense, the seed of Satan, the seed of the enemy, okay? And so you will see that this cosmic battle is ultimately between God and this, this fight over this world, okay? The earth, is it's a territory, right? Okay, God is going to, God's desire is to create this world to dwell with us, okay? That's why he created the world to dwell with mankind. And the enemy comes in and kind of puts a wrench in the plan. But God has already made provision because he says in Revelation that Yeshua has been crucified from the foundation of the world. So regardless of what the enemy and these fallen Elohim do, these lesser gods, these you know demons, if you want to call them, like God has a plan and he will bring about his kingdom and restore all things. We know that. The end of the story is already written and even the way in which it gets there is already determined. Okay, but all along, there are going to be people that basically have to choose sides. And that's, that's it. You can't be neutral in this battle. You are either for or against the God of Israel and his people and his plan. Okay, and the only way for us to have victory is through Yeshua. He's the one who has brought the victory. And he is the one who has basically put the enemy under our feet. He's already defeated the enemy at the cross, right? It's already done, okay? But the kingdom is still to come, okay? It will come when he restores all things at the end of time. There are still people that need to choose sides. That's ultimately what it comes down to, okay? But since this time, God has been taking territory back, okay? But, it's, but the thing is here, so we see this in Genesis chapter three, and then we see in Genesis chapter six, this strange verse in the very first part of Genesis that talks about these crazy creatures called the Nephilim. We learn in verse one that in time when men began to multiply on earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, which is another way to say the counsel of God or the, the lesser Elohim that he's created, um, saw the daughters of men were attractive and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And so guys, literally think about that. It's the seed of the enemy, right? Okay, these, they literally are creating an offspring from humankind. They're mixing with humankind and they are creating an unholy offspring. Okay, and the Bible describes them as Nephilim, which means giants. Okay, and it says in verse four that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Okay, so we need to understand that because the Nephilim existed the seed of the enemy began to proliferate that god eventually says enough yeah i'm sending a flood right after this god begins to talk but noah was righteous in the eyes of god he called upon the name of the lord and so noah and his family were saved but the nephilim it was important for god to destroy them all okay and this is what he does he basically starts over with noah um, and begins to then, then, okay, but we have to say this. So right after Noah, the story of Noah, what's happening in Genesis chapter 11? Tavern of Babel. Babel. Yeah. So right away, we see that God has started with Noah, but right away after they start to grow and multiply, there is rebellion again. And so they build what is called the tower, we call the Tower of Babel. And why? Because they were trying to make a name for themselves. And this is in direct opposition to, to Seth and the Shem and the people that were calling on the name of the Lord. So you see, you hear the, the difference, calling on the name of the Lord, making a name for yourself. Okay, so they are in rebellion. And it's interesting here um, in Genesis chapter 11 that it's actually, let's just read chapter 11, verse 5. It says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, look, the people are united. They have a single language and see what they are starting to do. At this rate, nothing they set out to accomplish will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so that they won't understand each other's speech. So from there, the Lord scattered them all over the earth and they stopped building the city. 
For this reason, it is called confusion, Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there, the Lord scattered them all over the earth. Now, I can't, I don't remember if the scripture was here, um, but essentially what happens is, is that, and I need to find the scripture, it's in this book, but there is a scattering of the people, and basically, God gives these lesser Elohim charge over these other nations okay god chooses israel for his own because right after genesis 11 we go right to genesis 12 where the choosing of abraham and ironically enough he calls him out of babylon calls him right out of babel okay but he chooses and now here's the choosing he chooses abraham and abraham's descendants and abraham's seed and what does he say right away basically in genesis 11 god is disinheriting the nations and is choosing their people but what does he say will happen through Abraham? The very first promise, Abraham, I'm going to use you through your seed. I'm going to bless what? The nations. The nations. So it's God's desire for all nations to dwell with him and to have this, this Eden together with God. But there is a, the Tower of Babel causes a disinheritance of the nations and God choosing Israel, but through Israel now, God's plan will continue and he will bless the nations and he will make a way for all of the nations to come back to him. Okay, and ultimately it's going to be through Yeshua the Messiah. But I want to speak about these crazy Nephilim, okay? So the flood destroys all of those. But guys, they must do it again. We must mm -hmm. think that it happened because the Bible reads in Genesis 6, there were Nephilim in those days and afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so let's go now to Numbers. So Numbers chapter 13. You guys remember this chapter. So what's the context here is that Moses has taken the, he's delivered them out of Egypt. And now here they are at Kadesh Barnea. And God says, send 12 spies, one from each of the tribes of Israel into the land. And what report do 10 of these spies come back with? They're giants. They're giants in the land. Guys, it's the Nephilim at the Hebrew word. They, I think it says, it actually says in verse 13, we saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak, who was from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we look like grasshoppers by comparison. And we look that way to them too. So they were scared and in fear of the Nephilim. Okay, so guys, this is what's happening in the conquest of Canaan. This is the key verse that we need to go back to to understand why God would say, destroy them all. Because mm -hmm. we think about, wait, our God is a God of compassion and mercy, but he's saying, don't even leave the children. Why? Because he's the bloodline. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the unholy seed of the Nephilim that will be perpetually at enmity with the seed of God and the seed of Messiah. Okay, and so what's happening when we get to the book of Joshua, and they know this, but God was actually, he made a distinction. To those who were descendants of the Nephilim, God's destruction was complete destruction. That was his instruction, destroy them completely. But those from the other nations that were not Nephilim, he gives them an opportunity to either join them or move. Like you don't have to destroy them. Okay, so there's different instruction. And so, and we'll see some key verses. It's not in Joshua 6, but there's one in Joshua 8, where Joshua actually reports to the people about the Nephilim, about the Rephaim. He says specifically, we conquered them. They were here, they were here. Like that was their mission. It was like another flood, but this time it was going to come through conquest of the people, the, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the enemy, okay? And so that's what this conquest is about. Guys, and interestingly enough, you know, people, humans, we can decide which side we want to be on, right? We can choose to walk in that, that righteous line of Abraham by faith through the Messiah, or we can choose to walk in disobedience to God and ultimately we're joining the seat of the enemy if we choose that, okay? Because like I said, there you have to choose sides, okay? And so, um, okay, let me make sure that that's all I wanted to say about that. So now let's go back to Joshua chapter six. 
Supernatural means are, were they destroyed completely? Because it, you know, the verse says, and even afterward they were there, but then the Tower of Babel happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there were some. the flood. Yeah, so, so I think that they they were destroyed by the flood, but then I think the sun, the angels came down and did it again. Again? Yeah. So they can do it again. They could yeah. if they wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't, and I don't know enough. I don't know that. You know, a lot, some people will try to say, you know, the Matthew 24 passage that Yeshua speaks about as in the days of Noah, so will be with the coming of the Son of Man. And some people try to make that comparison. I don't know. I, I don't know mm -hmm. if that's actually what's trying to be communicated there. It's a possibility, mm -hmm. possibility. Um, but I just can't say with certainty that that's the case. But we do know that the Bible tells us in the book of Joshua that they were fighting the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then they continued to fight the Nephilim because they didn't destroy them all. And who did David fight? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So he fought Goliath of Gath, who was mm -hmm. a Nephilim. He was a giant. Okay. So they continued, their seed continued, um, even all the way through the kings we read about them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know what's happened to them since. Yeah. <laughs> So did you, were you going to say something, Karen? No. <laughs> but, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is one, because I think it's important for us to understand what's going on in Joshua 6. And I think it's important for us to see that there is a, a supernatural worldview that the biblical writers had that has been really not, it's been hidden, right? Like we don't even think about it because in our modern eye, that sounds like fairy tales. Like guys, you know, Epic of Gilgamesh, you guys have heard that if you, you know, study history. So there's like, there's other writings of the time that, that correlate with what's happening here. There's stories of giants, there's stories of these demigods, you know, just think of even, you know, the Greek, I mean, all of these things, like, guys, this is, this was the reality of what was going on. This unseen realm and like what we can't see was on display at that time. Okay. And it was, it wasn't hidden. It's been hidden now, but, but that realm exists. And it's important for us to know that and important for us to understand where we are seated with Messiah. Where are we seated? At the right hand with him. And where is the enemy? Under our feet. Okay, so we get to actually walk in victory. And that's why I love when we study the book of Joshua and all the references to feet. Mm -hmm. You know, and as they, they go into the Jordan, put your feet in the water. Step on the dry ground with your feet. Everywhere you put the soles of your feet. Okay, territory. your territory. You're claiming it back. Mm -hmm. You are walking on the enemy. You are claiming your inheritance. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are all these physical pictures, guys, to point us to that reality that we get to live in. Okay, we get to walk from a place of victory. Okay, and so that's where we're seated with the Lord. So it's a holy war. And Joshua here is being told in Joshua chapter five that where you're standing is holy ground. Okay, this place that you're about to step in as you cross this Jordan and as you begin this conquest this is my chosen place, dwelling place. Israel belongs to me. The land of Canaan belongs to me. That's what God is saying. And you're going to drive out the seed of Satan and you're going to take possession of your inheritance yeah. as my people, okay? <laughs> so he, he is encouraging Joshua in this truth. And then he gives Joshua <laughs> this. Thanks for that. Then he gives Joshua his battle plans. Okay, it's not what you would imagine that he would give him a battle plan to do. But guys, there's so much in here. There's such significance and it's pointing to a greater time and a greater, greater redemption and a greater conquest of the land. Okay, but the story of Joshua is a picture of the second coming of Messiah. Even his name, Yeshua, it's, it's unmistakable that Joshua is a type and a shadow of Yeshua when he comes as a conqueror to destroy the enemy and to claim the land. I love some of the passages in the New Testament and really Yeshua told us this when he came. And so I'm gonna take us back to um, the uh, Caesarea Philippi. Okay, so Caesarea Philippi yeah. is in the Golan. It's north of the Sea of Galilee. It's a very, very, one of those significant territories, 
Okay, that is important for us to understand why would Jesus, this is in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus brings his disciple, um, Peter and some others to the, the foothills. I want you guys to understand where is Caesarea Philippi? It's right at the foothills at a very important mountain. Who knows the, the tallest and the highest mountain in the land of Israel? It's Mount Hermon, okay? Now, Mount Hermon, guys, is actually mentioned in the book of Enoch, of where the sons of God came down, inspired the women, and created this race. Okay, so Mount Hermon is one of those territories where the enemy has infiltrated, okay? And he actually, it's also referred to in the Bible as Bashan. Okay, Bashan means or like land of Satan and the serpent. Like place, it means the place of the serpent. I don't know if that's the Hebrew, but that is in the languages. I think it's Ugarit, but that means the place of the serpent. Okay, so Bashan, Mount Hermon, same place in the North Golan, the highest peak in Israel, the place that the book of Enoch describes the sons of God coming down and, and doing this. And so this is where Jesus brings his disciples. And this is where he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? Guys, he's putting the spiritual realm on notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is so cool. So he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you are the Mashiach. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, son, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my father in heaven. And he says, upon this rock, I, I bet he was pointing to Mount Bashan. Okay, and also realize this is where the pagan worship to the god Pan and Zeus, this is what was literally known in that time as the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. This area right here at the foothills of Mount Bashan, this was the no, gate. Like there. There's a cave there. And this is the gates of hell. They call it that. Yeah, and this is where Yeshua said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. He is putting the enemy on notice. He's pointing to Mount Bashan and saying, this mountain, okay, they need to realize who has just come, okay? And so he is basically preparing, and then not, not long after this, what Matthew, I mean, but Mark mm -hmm. and Luke show, they tell about the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And there are many scholars believe that it was on Mount Hermon that he goes up onto this high mountain and he transfigures into the glory of Yahweh and they see him in his glory and they see Moses, Moses and Elijah. And they said, we need to build some tents because that points to tabernacles. They recognize the appointed time of the glory of God dwelling in their midst. And it's happening at the gates of hell. No, but Sean, yes. I think it's interesting that you tied in Enoch. Yeah. Because Enoch, if you read this, the, the book of Enoch, it's really interesting, but at one point, the fallen angels asked him to intercede hmm. for them. And he goes into heaven, he has this whole experience, and he asks God, you know, can you forgive them? And God's like, go back and tell them they will never be forgiven hmm. because they are supposed to intercede for you, not the other way around. So he goes back and a, and a human delivers the judgment of God to the angels. And that's one thing that Paul says. He's he's like, you guys can't settle your disputes. Don't you know you'll be judging exactly. angels? Exactly. But so for Jesus to, 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 to do that in that place is also pretty cool because it's like God using his the son of God, the man, yeah, you know, Christ so Jesus, good. to deliver the judgment. Against and the that's angels. one of the key marks of Jesus is that he had the authority over the unclean spirits. That's right. That's and that what was intended. truly the, the, the great evidence of the kingdom of God. That's right. Because he said, if, if we cast these out, if I cast these out by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has, has come. come. Mm -hmm. The authority of God, you know. Right. And, and through man, yeah. authority over the devils. Exactly. And that should encourage us to understand, again, our position. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what issue has opened up those gates. And I love... Even are you getting excited over there? Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not gonna leave soon, but I'm excited. Okay, I'm glad you're excited. <laughs> but I love that picture, you know, and also thinking about like gates are stationary. 
The gates of hell, guys, they're not moving. What's moving, what's advancing is the kingdom of God. The, king, the gates of hell will not prevail again. So it's, it also gives us this understanding that guys, we're on mission. You know, we are joint heirs and we are moving and, and ultimately we'll be judging angels. Like, and that's what's so crazy. I mean, Ephesians, Paul talks about this, like the mystery that's being revealed through the people of God to the spiritual realm. God's using his creation who we have been called to bear his image and his likeness He's using us to teach the spiritual realm. That's, that's a big deal. And we're so clueless. Yeah. We're so clueless. Okay, but this is the reality. And this is what, what God is doing. And he's, I was going to say another thing about, I don't know if it was the gates of hell. It'll come to me. Can I just ask Yes, you, go so ahead. Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon. So uh, can you tell me again, what, what did the Lord do on that mountain? Transfiguration. Oh, Do you remember? Yes. But it's known as Bashan. Bashan. And I just looked it up and they said that even the, the mound on Bashan is a serpent shaped mound. I believe it. Yeah, it's like. It's called. So, so you guys. Right there where it's known as the place of the serpent is yes. where Jesus was transfigured. Yes. So mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the crush the head of the serpent. Mm -hmm. the head of the serpent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Are you going to say? I wonder what the spiritual atmosphere is now. Well, because then you would say Jesus was transfigured there, that it would be. It's, yeah. it's glory. It is. I've been there. I've been there too. Really mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. it is. It's really nice. So he conquered it. It's already done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it feels. It's it so feels beautiful, beautiful and peaceful yeah. there. Yeah. 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 Really. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, like you're talking about Goliath being like seed of the serpent or whatever mm -hmm. symbol, but like you know, David killed Goliath, cut off his head, you know, and and go up, of course the whole mark of the beast, the six six six, you know, any any. So the stone that David threw hits him in the forehead, where, you know, so then he cuts off his head and then he buries it, and then where Christ was crucified, the skull hill Golgotha, and that's yeah. where the skull of Goliath is buried, and so just that back. Again, tying it in with the seed of the servant, yeah. and you will crush his head. Yeah, like yeah. you will bruise his head, but you will crush his head. Yeah, it's this you know? huge cosmic battle. And it's really it's awesome, awesome, too, because she showed that thing where it looks like a snake on top of Golgotha. That's like a satellite image, right? Yeah. Yeah. It literally it really does okay. look like a snake on Bashan. Yeah, okay, so you guys, okay, but also, what's another <laughs> cool, cool thing right? is you do a satellite image of like Gilgal. In other places in the land of Israel, and what do you see? A giant footprint. You literally see the stones have been set in a giant footprint because God has placed his feet all over the land. Like Gilgal is where we read in Joshua chapter four, like after they crossed the Jordan, that was the first place they were called to camp. Right, and it's where the stigma of the Egypt has been rolled away, mm -hmm. and this is where God's yeah. footprint is. Again, guys, God is bringing a conquering people into the land, mm -hmm. right? And that's what is being foreshadowed. We know ultimately that Israel had their failures, but it's a shadow of what is to come that will be perfected in Messiah Yeshua. You know, the the army, the captain of the Lord's army, when he comes again, and he will rescue his people and he will bring them a greater exodus out of all the late nations of the world. They will cross the Jordan again and they will be established in the land and he will take back what the enemy has tried to steal. Okay, and so here in the book of Joshua, though, it's it's the people going in to fight the seed of the enemy fight the seed of Satan. And I love thinking about Mount Bashan. I love thinking about what Yeshua did on that mountain. Um, I even think about Psalm 22. Um, if you guys read Psalm 22, it's the, where Jesus, mm -hmm. when he's dying on the cross, mm -hmm. right? And he quotes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You read Psalm 22 and literally in, in, in the Hebrew tradition, a good rabbi will say the beginning of a Psalm and those who are his listeners would know the rest of the Psalm. It's like me saying, yeah, it's like me saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And you quote the rest, don't you? You you know it. And that's what they're doing. And so Yeshua quotes Psalm 22 as he's dying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You read Psalm 22 and you weep as you realize that this Psalm is so powerful because it talks about, you know, Yeshua, it's, it talks about being thirsty. It talks about your bones being poured out like wax. It actually talks about what it's like to be crucified and what's going on in the heart of our Messiah. And it talks about, these wild 
dogs of the mm-hmm. sun mm-hmm. that are circling mm-hmm. around, cackling. Because mm-hmm. the this is the enemy. The enemy, the, the plan of God was hidden to the enemy. Guys, this brings in the whole book of Esther. Remember when Jesus is healing the, the lepers? Don't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. It's time. It's not yet time to be revealed. Mm-hmm. He begins his ministry hidden, mm-hmm. right? Don't say it. it's not time yet. When his brothers in John chapter seven say, hey, they start cackling. Why don't you go up to the Feast of Tabernacles and show them, you know, who you are? And he's like, it's not the appointed time. It's not time. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. And I believe that when Yeshua transfigures on Mount Hermon, he is, he is making a bold declaration. But if the enemies of God and the seed of Satan knew that his death would actually bring about the, the redemption, they would not have been there circling around cackling, mm-hmm. thinking that they were, they knew he was the son of God, but they, the plan of God to redeem mankind through the death of Yeshua our Messiah was hidden from the enemy. Mm-hmm. And that, guys, that's been hidden from the Jewish people, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Right? And, 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 but there is a time that God's going to reveal that. Right? He, he promises a time when they will look on whom they pierced mm-hmm. and they will mourn as one mourns for an only son. And so the season and the time is near for that. But let's go back now to Joshua chapter six. Okay. We need to go, Matthew. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I know. It was, it was awesome. Well, it's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to leave her. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good to meet you. <laughs> um, so Joshua chapter six. One of the most significant parts of Joshua chapter six is the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, and we're gonna talk for just a little bit about the significance of the the plan that God gives to Joshua to attack Jericho. Everyone knows the story. This is the most famous story of Joshua, right? The plan is, is that you are going to take the Ark of the Covenant. Guys, is the Ark of the Covenant typically just out on display? No, where does it stay? Hidden. Right? The Ark of the Covenant is typically hidden in the Holy of Holies, and only one person, one day of the year, sees it. But what is God saying here? I want you to take the Ark and it's on, yeah, seven priests. It's on full display. All right, so the army's going ahead of the ark. The priests are there with seven shofars, and they're to blow the shofar incessantly. But everybody else is to remain silent. Each day, they're going to march around the city. Can you imagine, like, what is going on in the minds of the people in Jericho? Like, there are, we've already learned from Joshua that they are terrified. Okay, and, and even think about Rahab. Mm-hmm. She's probably in there going, Man, I hope they remember me. She's got her scarlet cord out there. I hope they remember me. She knows, you know, but, but they're completely silent. And there's no way that that God had all the million plus people marching around the city. It's probably the fighting men, you know, and it says there's a, a group in front and then the Ark of the Covenant and there's a group behind, but they're marching around. But he says, you're to remain silent for six days. You're going to march one time around. And you're going to blow those shofars, seven shofars. You're going to march for seven days. On the seventh day, you're going to blow those shofars. And when I tell you, when you finish that lap, I want everybody to yell. Guys, that, that's scary. <laughs> I imagine they, you know, have you guys ever seen the veggie tail mm-hmm. one with the peas walking? <laughs> <laughs> the way that it's described in the veggie tales is they're like keep walking and they're kind of taunting them from the the walls of Jericho but I kind of think it's a different feel at all I think it's a different vibe I think they're they're like shaking in their boots and they're wondering what's about to happen mm-hmm. and when that war cry sounds I bet they were all like hiding scared hiding in caves like it says in Revelation chapter 6 when the kings of the earth hide in fear okay so so what's happening here, I believe that, you know, there are glimpses of end time significance in these battles that God gives Joshua to fight. And we'll talk about one big one in Joshua chapter eight. But I believe what I see here, when I look at Joshua chapter six, I mean, there's a lot of sevens here, isn't there? Mm-hmm. What other book of the Bible has a lot of sevens? 
Revelation, Revelation, right? Okay, and especially seven shofar, seven trumpets. Okay, so we're, we're, getting, we're getting a lot of the same imagery that we see in the book of Revelation. And we understand that what's happening in the book of Revelation is that Yeshua, our Joshua, is coming to clean, clean, clean up house, right? He's ready to come and destroy the enemies of God's people. This is why he's coming. He's coming for two things. He's coming to redeem his own people and to bring them into the land of Israel. And he's coming to destroy the, the enemies of God's people. He's coming to destroy the seed of Satan and rescue the seed of the woman, right? That's what he's coming to do. And so we know that the same thing is happening here in Joshua. He's brought them, you know, he was with Moses. They were redeemed out of Egypt and now they're being called to go and conquer the land. It's the same story, okay? It's the same. It's a picture, a type, and a shadow. And so we look at these sevens, we're going to think, well, what, you know, what could this possibly be? So I just have a theory that it could be that this is like, so when I read the book of Revelation, of course, this is a kajillion year study. This takes years for us to actually go through verse by verse in the book of Revelation. I've done it several times. It's my favorite book. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've often noticed, and this is just my own interpretation, there's other ideas and theories out there, but you know, there are, there are three sets of sevens in the book of Revelation. We have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. So the seven seals, if you were to take um, this Revelation chapter six, and you would line it up with Matthew chapter 24 with Yeshua telling his disciples, what's going to happen at the end of the age. They're like, when will all these things happen? What does that look like? And he, he essentially goes through a timeline of the last days. These are the signs. These are the things that you will look for. And it ends with him returning in glory, gathering his people, then looking on the one they pierced and him bringing them to the land of Israel. So it ends with the return of Messiah. Okay. So whenever you look at Revelation chapter six, which is the seven seals, and you follow along what's going on in Matthew 24, there are some amazing parallels that you look at. And I'm like, man, that's really hard to miss that when Jesus says this about there's going to be, you know, you're going to suffer. And it's in line with everything like that's happening in, in Revelation chapter six about the fifth seal. When it's talking about martyrdom, it's like, wait, how come every seal lines up with everything Jesus is saying in order? Why is that? And so my theory is that possibly, and I, and I don't know for sure, but perhaps the, and also consider this, Revelation 6 ends with um, the wrath of God. Revelation 6 ends, the, the, the sixth um, seal unleashes God's wrath, okay? And that is specifically fleshed out, if you will, in Revelation chapter 16, 17, 18, okay? The wrath of God. So, I wonder if Revelation chapter six is an overview, very much like what Matthew chapter 24 is, because it actually goes line by line with everything that Yeshua is saying. How does that fit into the seven trumpets and the seven bowls? I don't know yet. I don't know how that works. I'm still seeking. Um, and, and I know that there are people who have their own theories. And again, this is just something that I've been kind of pondering. So if that's the case, I want us to consider Joshua in the lens of being a type and shadow of these next two sets of seven, okay? So we have the seven trumpets now that happen after the seven seals are opened, okay? It actually says the seventh seal opens the seventh trumpet. I don't know that the timing is as clear as we want it to be. You know, I want to read Revelation chronologically, but you can't. It's very, it's, it's, it's one of those things where there's a lot of hiddenness. It's like the book of Esther. It's, and this is what was described to Daniel, right? Hey, seal this up. It's going to be confusing. But I want to show you there's a time when it's going to be open to you and he's going to bring the revelation, okay? And so I, like, I, wanna, I wonder if what's happening in Joshua as they begin <clears throat> to blow each day these seven shofars, if it's almost like each year of the tribulation, Okay, the seven shofars that are sounding are like seven years of the tribulation. And each time they march around the, the walls, it's like one year. And, and what's amazing about this, this thought is like, as that shofar is being sounded, God's bringing judgment, right? In the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, judgments are coming with each walk around the city, 
Okay, so it's not an exact parallel because God's not judging the city in, in Joshua's time yet. But if you can imagine what it's foreshadowing is that because the shofar is a, is a sound of war. Okay, it's synonymous with the voice of God and God is bringing certain judgment. Okay, it's coming. And for the city of Jericho, which I believe could be a type and a shadow of the Antichrist and the ultimate dis destruction that's coming to, if we were to say this represents a picture of all of the enemies. Okay, if we just take Jericho, isolating it and say, okay, maybe this is a picture of the enemy and God's wanting us to see a glimpse of what it's going to be like. Okay, so imagine the enemies here and each year God's like giving this warning. Judgments are coming. Okay, judgments are being unleashed each time. And and what's amazing, though, is that the Ark of the Covenant is on display. Like, what's the Ark of the Covenant? God's presence. Okay? Like, there's an opportunity to repent. Okay? The Ark of the Covenant represents the mercy and the compassion of God. The blood of the sacrifice covers and atones. Okay, so they, they have this opportunity that like God's presence is there. And at each time they're circling, okay, there's an opportunity to repent. The sound of the shofar is heard. What is the shofar meant to do? Awaken, stir our hearts, turn us to repentance. Isaiah 26 says the same thing about God's judgments. It says the judgments of God, when the judgments of God are in the earth, people learn what righteousness is. God's judgments are meant to bring repentance, okay? 100%. It is a warning. It is an opportunity for us to turn from our sin and turn to God. Guys, I'm about to run out of... Okay, so I think I was talking about the potential that these shofar blasts that are being sound are pictures of the judgments that will come from the shofar, the the trumpets that are in the book of Revelation, okay? And so if we think of the analogy, it's like if those first six days are like those first six years and we have a trumpet blast going every year, right? God's judgment's being unleashed so that people will repent. The Ark of the Covenant is, you know, on display, meaning that there's opportunity for us as God's people to shine the light of hope and truth right? And then you get to that last day, you know, and what happens at the sixth uh, trumpet or the seventh trumpet? What, what does that unleash? Right. So if we, let's go to Revelation 11 and let's just look at that for a second. So in Revelation chapter 11, it describes the last few trumpet blasts. And what's really amazing here is what's explained right after the trumpet blast because wow i think it points right us back to joshua so the seventh angel sounds his shofar and there are loud voices in heaven and they're saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and his messiah and he will rule forever and ever and it says that the 24 elders sitting on their thrones, they fall and they worship God. And they say, we thank you, Lord, God of heaven's armies. Again, guys, that's going to point us back to Joshua, if anything. The one who was and is, and you have taken your power. You have begun to rule. The Gentiles raged, but now your rage has come. What is the rage? This is the wrath of God. Okay, a time for the dead to be judged, a time for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your holy people. Those who stand in awe of your name both small and great. It's also a time for destroying those who destroy the earth. So what two things is it time for? It's time for rewarding his people and destroying, right, the enemy, okay? So this is the seventh trumpet, which I believe is like the seventh day marching around Jericho. And what does the seventh trumpet unleash? the seven bowls of God's wrath. So it's like on the seventh day, you're walking around seven times, right? And so it's this double seven. Okay, on the seventh day, don't just walk once, walk seven times because it's actually, I believe, pointing to what's happening on that seventh trumpet sound. And what does it say to do in Joshua chapter six? What are they to do on the last day? Not only is everyone to shout, but it says, give a long blast right? It says, let me go back to it. It says here, um, 
So in verse uh, 10 is when it talks about, don't let your voices be heard. So circle around. Then on the seventh day, verse 15, they got up early at sunrise and they went around the city in the same way seven times. This was the only day they encircled the city seven times. Then the seventh time, when the priests blew on the shofars, Joshua said to the people, shout, because the city has been given over to you. Um, and actually, if you go back, sorry, in the very first part of um, <clears throat> chapter six, when the instruction is given, it said on the seventh day, this is verse four, on the seventh day, you are to march around the city seven times and the priests will continue to blow the shofars and they are to blow a long blast on the shofar. On hearing the sound of the shofar, all the people are to shout as loudly as they can and the city will fall down flat. So the instruction is, is that on that last day, they were to give a long blast. And then that is very similar to the imagery, the language of the Feast of Trumpets of the Day of Atonement. There is a long blast. Think about the words of Jesus. Think about the words of Paul. When you hear the trumpet sound, you know, Yeshua is going to come at the sound of the trumpet. All of these things are happening at the trumpet. Okay. And, and Paul even talks about the great trumpet, the last trumpet. The last trumpet that Paul's speaking about is the last trumpet of Revelation chapter 11. Because what's happening at the last trumpet? The kingdom is being established. He's rewarding and he's judging, right? Okay, so Revelation 11 is pointing, this is the end of it. And then what happens, guys, in Revelation 11, verse 19? The temple of God in heaven was open, and what do you see? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark, this is verse 19. The Ark of the Covenant was seen in the temple. Flashes of lightning, voices, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and violent hail. Guys, Joshua is showing us just a mini picture, okay, of what is going to happen. And the, and the thing that should be, is most of the time hidden, is on full display. The Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant, guys, it's ultimately a picture of Yeshua, right? He's the one who is the blood atonement. He's the one, what's inside the Ark of the Covenant? Who knows? What's inside the ark? The, the, Torah. the Torah. Okay, is Yeshua not the living Torah? Right. Okay, what else? The budding the rod and Aaron. Aaron. Why? Because it's the high priest. Is not Yeshua the high priest? Okay, what else is in there? Right. Manna. Is he not the bread of life? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant has multiple pictures, again, pointing us to our Messiah, who is going to be on full display. And why do we know that? We can look at Revelation chapter one. It says that every eye will see him, right? He's going to be on full display. He's going to be marching. I'm using the language of Joshua, but it's like he's marching around the whole earth so that people will turn. And the shofar is sounding because the shofar is saying it's warning and it's calling people to repentance and it's calling them to wake up. Okay, his judgment is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. Okay, but he's conquering. He's bringing judgments. He's bringing about the kingdom of God. He's in, he, and it will happen here in Revelation as at, at the sound of the last trumpet. Okay, and, I, and I, I just, I look at Joshua 6. I'm like, oh man, I wonder if that is, is, is a picture of those seven trumpets and on that last day seven times is like the seven bowls of God's wrath because when the Ark of the Covenant is opened in the temple, I want you guys to skip Revelation 12, Revelation 13. I want you to go all the way to Revelation chapter 15. And at the very end, okay, again, you hear great and wonderful the things that you've done. Great God of heaven's armies, the same language that we just read in Revelation 11. They're glorifying God for conquering, for completing what he has been, what he was going to do. And then it says, after this, I looked in the sanctuary, that is the tent of witness in heaven was opened. Guys, this is what we just read in Revelation 11. So what we're seeing here is that we're skipping now to Revelation 15, because what Revelation 15, 16, and 17 is going to do is actually going to give us more detail about what's going on exactly as the Ark of the Covenant is being revealed at the seventh trumpet. And Revelation 16 and 17 begins to talk about the seven bowls of God's wrath. Okay, as soon as that the tent of witness is open in heaven, it says that the angels um, are... Then um, verse chapter 16, verse one, I heard a loud voice from the sanctuary of the tent of witness, okay? The seven angels are being told, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of God's fury. 
And then it goes into detail and describes what those are. And so again, the connection between the seven trumpets being this time that at the end of seven trumpets, we have the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a picture of Yeshua coming down. It's actually Yeshua, the Ark of the Covenant being revealed. And as he's coming down, he's establishing his, his kingdom reign by doing two things, rewarding his people and destroying his enemy. Okay, he comes as judge. The Hebrew word for judge means both savior and judge. Okay, so he comes with a dual purpose, rescue and redemption and salvation and reward for his people and judgment for the enemy. Okay, and so the book of Revelation, you know, I think that we could jump over to that. And if you wanted to read on your own, all these seven bowls of God's wrath, but that is, I believe what's, what's ultimately going to end with those seven bowls. And in Joshua, remember it happens in a single day. It actually uses that same language in describing the seven bowls of God's wrath. It says that these bowls come out in a single day. So it's like on that last day around, the seven trumpet sounds, you do it seven times because it's like the seven bowls of God's wrath. And then what happens after that? The enemy is defeated. They go in and they take the land. Okay, they take the city. Okay, so again, just a picture, a foreshadow, possibly of what the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of God's wrath are pointing towards. So let's go back to Joshua chapter six because there's more. And I, again, like I didn't have time to, to really study. And so I, I know that there's a lot more that I think we're going to pull from Joshua six. So just know, I think I'm going to come back to this. Um, but I, there's a few things I do want to point out. Um, and one of them is, you know, again, like this crazy, like amazing battle just happens. It's not really a battle. God is actually doing all the fighting. He, and it's the sound of his voice. How, and that's the other thing. How is the defeat coming? The blowing of the shofar in, in, in the Hebrew understanding, like the shofar is synonymous with the voice of God because when Moses, when Moses in Exodus 19, when Yeshua, when God comes down onto the mountain and gives him Torah, that's when we hear the shofar blast. That's the sound that we first hear. And so for a Jewish mind, the sound of the shofar is like the voice of God. Okay, so imagine that kind of imagery and connect that to how we know Yeshua will bring destruction upon the enemy. What does he do? It's that the breath of his mouth Okay, it's the, the, the Bible describes it as the sword coming out of his mouth. Okay, and it's, it's really the breath of his mouth. It's like his words. Like God created everything with his words. He's going to end it with his words. He's going to say it's finished. And it's with the breath of his mouth that it will literally bring destruction of the enemy. And that's what we see in Joshua. They weren't actually fighting this battle. The, the walls came down with the breath of God's mouth. And the, the victory came before they even went into battle. God had already given it to them. And, he, and in the sound of the shofar is like the voice of God saying the walls are coming down. Victory is here. It's the sound of victory. Okay. And so they made a shout of victory. And so it was really like their words. They, they, they came into agreement with the sound of God's shofar. And they, they walked into the city after God brought the walls down. So, but in the midst of this, God doesn't forget Rahab. And that's what I want to look at now in, um, you know, verse 25, it says, Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute, her father's household and everything she had. And she has continued living with Israel from then until now. What has this Gentile done? She has joined herself to God's people. She has been grafted in to the people of God. And it says, why did he save her? It says, because she hid the messengers Joshua had sent to spy out the land. So again, this theme of hiddenness right here in the book of Joshua. And guys, what's so cool about the Torah portion right now is all about the describing the Ark of the Covenant. That's what the Torah portion is for this week, is the description of the Ark of the Covenant. And I believe that God wanted us to see that what has been hidden and the Ark stays hidden in the Holy Holies is now going to be revealed. Okay, He is going to take off the blinders. He is going to bring what was hidden to the forefront. He's going to reveal his Jewishness. He's going to reveal that he is the one that, that, that's been pierced. And it says that we will see him. It's time for the unveiling. 
And guys, what is the book of Revelation about? Revelation, revealing the word, it's in the word. Revelation is the revealing of Yeshua, the Messiah. Okay, so this is what we are waiting for. We are waiting for the revealing of Yeshua. And we learned from tonight that there are hints of this in the story of Esther and Purim. There are hints of this in the book of Joshua, that we are going to see the captain of the Lord's army, that we are going to see a Jewish Messiah, that we are going to see the one who brings deliverance for God's people. We are going to see the one that was transfigured on Mount Bashan, and he is going to bring about deliverance, and victory, and restore all things. So I want to end actually with Isaiah chapter 30. So Isaiah 30 is another passage about hiddenness and revealing. And we're going to go ahead and start in verse, verse 12. So the prophets are really amazing because the prophets are going to have a word for the people at that time, but almost always they also have a prophetic fulfillment yet to come, that they are going to have multiple fulfillments. Like when, when, when Isaiah is giving his prophecies concerning the destruction of Babylon, he, you know, I mean, of Jerusalem by Babylon, like that was for that season and that time. Guys, but it relates to the last days. It it's, a, it's like one of those things hidden pointing towards the Messiah and the work of Messiah. And so we can see um, this promise that God's made to his people Israel here in chapter 30, verse 12. So it says, therefore, here's what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you reject this word, trust and exhortation and rely on deceit, this sin will come this sin will be come for you a crack bulging on, out high on a wall, showing signs it is ready to fall. Then suddenly all at once it breaks. He will break it like a clay pot, 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 sorry, ruthlessly shattering it to pieces. So tiny, not even a pot's heart remains for taking fire from the fireplace or scooping water from the cistern. For this is what the Lord most high says, the Holy one of Israel. Returning and resting is what will save you. Calmness and confidence will make you strong, but you want none of this. No, you say we will flee on horseback, therefore we will surely flee, and we will ride on swift ones, so your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one, and you all will flee at the threat of five, until you are left isolated like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. That's super depressing. Because this is like that first edict we talked about in the story of Esther. This is the reality of our waywardness. This is the reality of Israel's condition of sin, of rebellion, of pursuit of things other than God. And the Bible speaks very clearly that there will be consequences for these choices. Okay, but then verse 18, God's giving another decree. Okay, he's not gonna rescind this one that he just sent because he's spoken it. You can't do away with it. It's there, it exists. And if you continue in your sin, these consequences are real and they will continue and you will suffer. But he says in verse 18, yet the Lord is just waiting to show you favor. He will have pity on you from on high for the Lord is a God of justice. Happy are all who wait for him. People in Zion who live in Jerusalem will weep no more. Guys, remember the story of Haman? They were weeping, right? It was meant to be a time of weeping because Haman said that you're all going to be destroyed. But then it says, at the sound of your cry, they're weeping, they're fasting, they're mourning. It says, he will show you his grace on hearing it. When he hears your weeping, your repenting, your mourning, what will he do? He will answer. He says, though the Lord may give you but bread and water and not very much of that, I mean, that sounds a lot like fasting. Okay, they, these people are weeping, they're repenting, they're fasting. But God says, your teacher will no longer what? Hide. The hiddenness is about to be revealed. Your teacher will no longer hide from you. Why does he say teacher? I love that he says teacher. Because guys, Yeshua is our teacher. He's our rabbi, right? And what is he teaching us? He's teaching us Torah. This word for teacher actually comes from the same root 
Torah shares the same root. Okay, so the living Torah will no longer hide himself from you. And hasn't, hasn't Yeshua been hidden from the Jewish people? Yes, but he says there's coming a time that he's going to show his people grace. And he's saying that I will no longer hide myself from you. But with your own eyes, you will see. You will see your teacher. With your ears, you will hear a word from behind you. This is the way. Stay on it, whether you go to the right or to the left. You will treat as unclean your silver-covered covered idols and cast your metal images plated with gold. You will throw them away like minstrel cloths. You will say to them, get out of here. Guys, you got to understand that these, this idol worship wasn't like they were just worshiping silver and gold. These idols were connected to deities. They were connected to these fallen angels, these lesser Elohim that had rebelled against God. And they had joined themselves. And that's why, that's, that was why God said annihilate them from the, city, from the land. Because they would continue to be persuaded by the temptation and they continue to join themselves into these unholy covenants with false deities that had, had pit themselves against God, Elohim, Most High, Yahweh. He says, but then here's the restoration. So he says, you're going to cast all those away. You're basically going to say that your covenant with death has been annulled. I'm no longer going to be worshiping false gods. My fornication is done. He says, then he will give you rain for the seed and you will sow your land, or used to sow your land. And the food that comes from the ground will be rich and abundant. When that day comes, your cattle will graze in spacious pastures. The oxen and donkeys will work the land. You will, will eat a tasty mixture, winnowed free of shaft spread with by pitchfork and shovel on every high mountain and lofty hill will be streams and flowing brooks a day of great slaughter when the towers fall moreover the light of the moon will be as bright as the light of the sun the light of the sun will be seven times stronger like the light of seven days in one on the day the lord binds up the wounds of his people and heals the bruise caused by the blow what bruise guys remember genesis chapter three Okay, the enemy's going to bruise, but God's going to crush the head of the enemy, and he's going to restore. This is a promise of restoration. God is saying, you were sinful, but in my grace and my compassion, as you repent and mourn and turn to me, I will be faithful to you, and I will restore you. And it goes on, here comes the name of Yahweh from afar, Yahweh from afar, his anger burning and thick rising smoke. His lips are full to the brim with furry fury, his tongue a consuming fire. Uh-oh, here's the second reason why he's coming. Not only is he coming to restore the people of Israel and restore God's people to the land and to bring recompense for all that's been wrong to them and to reward them like we just read in, in the book of Revelation, but there's the fury of God that's also coming for, for the enemy and for those who have joined to the seat of Satan. And this is a terrifying thought. His breath is like a racing torrent that rises up to the neck to sift the nations with a sieb of destruction and put a bridle in the people's mouths to lead them astray. But then he says to his people, your song will be like one that is sung on a night when a holy feast is kept and your hearts will be happy as if walking to the sound of the flute, to the mountain of Adonai, to the rock of Israel. Guys, the imagery here, I have to stop. And just, guys, you have to understand what's being spoken here. And the imagery, guys, it points us to the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, think of Purim. Think of a day like Purim, a time of mourning that's turned into a time of joy, a time of feasting, a time of sorrow that's turned into a time of, again, rejoicing. And here, that's what he says. Your song will be like one that is sung on a night when a holy feast is kept and your hearts will be happy. Guys, we've got to start thinking about the Feast of Tabernacles and we start thinking about being happy. Okay, because God is dwelling with us and it's a season of joy. And this whole idea of the sound of the flute, guys, in the Mishnah, in the, the writings of the Jewish people during the second period, the temple period, there are writings that speak about what's going on in the Feast of, during the Feast of Tabernacles in the temple. There's actually somebody, a, a priest that's playing the flute in the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles, during the water libation ceremony, the very last day of the feast, the great day of the feast. Okay, and he's playing a flute. He's called the pierced one. He's actually calling forth the, the, the priest bringing the water from the pool of Siloam. He's calling forth the wind and the water 
that the priests are bringing in with the willow branches and with the water from the pool of Siloam. And he's playing on his flute. And this is the imagery that's hearing where this happiness that they're feeling is because it's the Feast of Tabernacles. God is dwelling with them. He's coming back and he's bringing a reward and he's destroying the enemy and he's dwelling in their midst. And they're rejoicing as they rejoice on the Feast of Tabernacles. And they're hearing the sound of the flute because it's ushering in the presence of God into their midst. And it goes on to say, to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. Guys, this holy mountain of God is in stark contrast to the mountain of Bashan. Okay, this is again, God taking back his rightful territory. Okay, he's returning and he's bringing his wrath and his judgment against the enemy. And it says, Adonai will make his glorious voice heard, the shofar, and he will reveal his arm descending. What is the arm of the Lord? Guys, we talked at length about this. The arm of the Lord, again, it's Yeshua. It's the arm that rescued the people out of Egypt. This language is used so many times all over Torah, especially in regard to restoring or taking the people out of Egypt. He rescues them with his righteous right arm. In, in Isaiah 53, it says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And it goes on to talk about he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. So it literally says the revealing of the arm of the Lord is revealed through the pierced Messiah. Okay, so here it says that he will reveal his arm descending. And that's exactly what Zechariah speaks about. As it says, they look. So imagine Yeshua is coming and they're looking on whom they've pierced. Yeah, you had it right there. They're looking on whom they've pierced and they will mourn as one mourns for an only son. Exactly what's being quoted in John or Revelation chapter one. He's actually quoting. This is what Yeshua is quoting in Matthew 24. They're all speaking about this moment. This time when the Ark of the Covenant is revealed and Yeshua, the arm of the Lord, descends and every eye sees him and his people see him and they, they, they mourn because they realize he was the one that was pierced. The Isaiah 53 Messiah was Yeshua all along and here he comes descending and it says he's descending with furious anger and a flaming firestorm. This is not the Jesus we talk about in Sunday school. With cloudbursts, tempests, and hailstones. Guys, these are things that the wrath of God has talked about in Revelation 17. For the Lord's voice, Adonai's voice, will terrify Asher. Asher is where the Antichrist will come from. As with his scepter, he strikes them down. Every sweep of the punishing rod that Yahavah imposes on him will be to tambourines and lyres. So you see this crazy contrast of rejoicing, redemption, salvation, freedom, jubilee, wrath, judgment, destruction. Are you choosing the seed of the woman or the seed of the serpent? There's no middle ground. He either comes as your savior or he comes as your judge. And it is the wrath of God. And it's a terrifying sight. As he brandishes his arm against them in battle, for the Tophet fire pit has long been ready. What in the world is that? Okay, guys, this is the Hebrew word where we get what is uh, translated in the New Testament as hell, basically. Okay, it's the genom. It's the valley that's actually situated right there next to Mount Zion, the Hinnom Valley. Have you heard of this? You've been there because you, you've been to Israel. You've been sitting, you've been in the city of David. You look to your right, you see the Mount of Olives. Okay. You, you go down the Mount of Olives, you're in the Kidron Valley. Just north of that, outside the old city walls is the Hinnom Valley. This is a valley that historically, actually the first mention is in the book of Joshua. And guess who lived there? Giants. It's right next to the, Ref, the the Valley of Giants, the Rephaim, the Nephilim. Okay, so there it is right there. And, and it says, and Jesus talks about this in the New Testament. We, it translates to our day as hell because it's a place of burning. It's a place of fire. It's actually a place during the ancient times that they would worship the gods of Molech and other gods and they would sacrifice their children. And so the Hebrew word here, to, to fit actually means wailing. And who's wailing is the children that are being burned. 
It's the, the, the sacrifice of these children. It's the, so this is a very, one of those unholy places, okay? That actually the book of Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah, he describes that actually you see that valley right there from the throne of God. And it's a constant reminder. It's the same pit, the same valley that's been prepared for Satan. If we go back to Revelation chapter 19, I'm going to actually turn there so that you guys can see that. But let's go back to Revelation 19, which is the, um, the, the description of Messiah coming in all of his glory with the armies of heaven following him. And it talks about some of these same imagery. We see him coming. Um, it says, verse 14, the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him on horses. And out of his mouth, what's, what's the mouth? Remember the mouth language we just read in Isaiah? That it says, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, which will strike down nations. He will rule them with a staff of iron. That same imagery we just read in Isaiah chapter 30. It is he who treads the winepress from which flows the wine of, of the furious rage or wrath of Adonai or Yahweh, God of heaven's armies. And on his robe and on his thigh is a name, King of kings, Lord of lords. And then it says that he gathers all the birds of the air to flesh on, to, to eat on the flesh of the kings. Okay, those who have the, been opposed to God. Okay, and then it says here in verse 20, it says the beast is taken captive. The beast we know is where Satan, the Antichrist, comes and dwells inside the beast. The beast is taken captive and with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the miracles which had used to deceive, um, sorry, let me make sure I was recording, this, to deceive all the people who worshiped him. And what were they, they were thrown where? Into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So this lake of fire has been prepared for the beast and the false prophet. It's the same valley of Hinnom, okay, that Jesus talks about in the gospels that's mentioned here in Isaiah 30, a place that's prepared for who? The Antichrist and the false prophet who are the ones that are, that the enemy is using for this great cosmic battle, battle over territory, over lives, over people. Okay, the, the, the battle will come to an end with the breath of the mouth of Yeshua, and it will bring destruction to the enemy, and he will be defeated. And it says after this that Satan, that serpent of old, the dragon, is thrown into a pit. He's thrown in, in chains for a thousand years, and Yeshua begins his reign on the earth for a thousand years. Okay, and so this is this is what's happening. Let's go back to Isaiah 30. So it says, for the Tophet fire pit has has long been ready. So here Isaiah is telling us that this pit that's being prepared has long been ready for Satan, for the beast, for the Antichrist. Prepared for the king, made large and deep, with plenty of wood and blazing with fire, like a stream of sulfur, the Lord's breath sets it aflame. Isn't that scary? It's a, but guys, so here, this is the story, okay? That there has been a season of hiddenness that is about, that is even now being revealed, okay? It is the time of the revealing of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Ark of the Covenant. It's the time for his people, for his Jewishness to be made known. It's a time for his people to be saved. It's a time for the destruction of the enemy. And it's the time for Yeshua to be seen. And so what do we do? What's our response? How do we, and it's a time ultimately that ends with God dwelling with us, tabernacles, a thousand years, the, the, the dwelling of God with man, right? That's what we're, we're waiting for. And so how do we respond? How do we take what we've learned here and apply it to our lives and, and, and move and, and be like Esther? Like that's what we need to look at. Like how, what is our role? How do we play a part in this great cosmic story that has already been written and determined, but we as people get to make choices and we as people get to either choose to engage in this battle that's already won, but still being fought, or we can sit on the sidelines and just watch, you know, how can we engage in what God is doing? And I would say that Esther gives us a key, right? Prayer, fasting, intercession for God's people. We've got to do that as the Gentile bride. Physically, we're hiding Jews in the last days. If we're here, when that happens, 
okay? We are, we're, we're physically partaking in the last day's battle. Ultimately, if we understand it right, whenever he gathers all of us in the four corners of the earth and we go with him and descend onto Mount Zion, we're an army. We're an army. And thankfully, I don't know that we're going to have to do much fighting because it's with the breath of his mouth that the enemy is destroyed. But we need to be to understand our position, our place. We are part of the army of God. And that there's a battle raging, and we are called to engage in that battle. We come from a place of victory, and that's what we, we learned about the very beginning. We sit in heavenly places with him. So let's pray. I think I've talked enough. Um, God, thank you, God, so much for your word. Um, I pray that you would um, reveal to us what you're asking us to do. God, I thank you for the shadows, the types, the pictures that you've given us, God, in Joshua, in Purim, Esther. Um, we thank you for the promises. We thank you for um, the very real reality that Yeshua is coming quickly and that you will reveal the Ark of the Covenant, the risen Messiah, the, the pierced one to all the world. Every nation will see and every person, God, you will give the opportunity to repent. And so, God, I pray that as your people, God, we would represent you well, that we would be a part of that revealing, God, that we would live our lives worthy of our call, God, that we would not sit on the sidelines, but we would engage, that we would listen with obedience like Joshua to the commander of the Lord's army, and that we would boldly go out and advance your word. God, that the, the living testimony of the Ark of the Covenant that's in us will be on display through us, God, that we would, would not stay hidden, but God, that we would reveal the work that you have done and will do. God, would you please use us? We want to say, here we are, God. Would you use us as your vessels of revealing your name, of revealing your love and your compassion and your grace and your mercy? God, let us not grow weary in doing good, but let us be girded with your truth and let us walk in bold confidence, Lord. We thank you that the enemy is under our feet, that we don't have to fear, God, that we don't have to fear the, the, the lesser gods and the, um, the Nephilim and all these things, God. You have already won the battle and we thank you that the victory and the battle belongs to you. And just as sure as you spoke to Joshua that the land is yours, God, you say that to us, that the inheritance is yours. So if we are living in defeat, God, would you help us to shake off the dust and rise up to our position as your people and let us begin to walk victoriously. God, I pray for the women and, and the, the, the people who hear this message, God, that you would instill in their hearts faith, that faith would rise up, Lord God, that they would no longer be bound by the, the, the sin that easily entangles them or the lies of the enemy that, that tempts them or causes them to stay hidden in fear or unbelief or doubt or whatever it is that is constraining your people. Would you loosen those chains and would you cause them to rise up? Of the, would you cause them to step out in faith and wherever they put their feet, God, may the land be claimed for your kingdom. God, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth and in the heavenlies. God, I thank you for the reality that you have already conquered the enemy and the spirit realm has been put on notice and you are king and your authority rules and reigns. And we thank you that that's where we fix our eyes, that that is the truth that sustains and the hope that carries us through. And so God, let us walk faithfully in your word and let us be a light in the darkness let us be those who bring your hope to those who are in the shadows of doubt unbelief fear sin god let us be your hands and feet thank you lord for calling us out of darkness thank you for being our god thank you for choosing us to dwell to dwell with us god we're humbled god thank you reveal yourself through us Empower us by your spirit. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.